This week, the National Institutes of Health allocates $200,000 in tax money to train men to sound more like women. Meta's CEO is forced to make a very public apology. And parents in Montana claim the state kidnapped their 14-year-old daughter over a gender transitioning dispute. These stories and much more coming up this week on The Lion, Week in Review. Welcome into this week's edition of The Lion Week in Review. It's a weekly look at the culture, the courts, your state capital, and your kids. I'm Chris Stigall. And now let's meet our panel, some of the men and women behind the stories at ReadLion.com. Michael Ryan is the executive editor, Josh Mann, the managing editor, and Liam Siegler, Herzog Foundation ambassador and contributor to The Lion. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. You Thank bet. You. Let's start with uh, an explosive bit of testimony on Capitol Hill in the last week or so from uh, the Meta CEO, formerly Facebook CEO, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, Missouri Senator Josh Hawley is famous in these uh, settings, Michael Ryan, for, uh, well, what do you want to say? Uh, camera time, mic time, he makes it count every time. I would not want to be on the other side of a courtroom <laughs> with this guy. This was a remarkable moment. Uh, I, I told somebody, you know, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg was just stunned by the ferocity and the logic, I think, of Holly's questioning. And he it was a deer in the headlights look. And I, But I, I've never seen a deer in the headlights stand up, turn towards you and apologize, which he did to the audience at Holly's urging. Um, it's a remarkable moment. Histori it felt historic, but at the same time, uh, number one, he had to be shamed into it. Number two, there was no admission of fault. And number three, it's meaningless if nothing changes. Holly used their own stats at Meta against them. He said, number one, 37% of girls ages 13 to 15 experienced unwanted nudity in the past week. 24% unwanted sexual advances and 17% self-harm content. Um, and this week at Holly's request, the Senate uh, took up by unanimous consent whether to pass a bill allowing people victimized by this material online to sue. And it was blocked by Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon, so it went nowhere. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's this would have been incredibly damning in, in a court of law. Liam Siegler, you're the youngest member of the panel. I always like to lean on youth mm -hmm. because in your generation, you don't, you don't know anything uh, about life without social media. Unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of the, we older <laughs> folks uh, do. We remember a time when it didn't exist. So is it common knowledge amongst young people today that social media is dangerous or do you think it's still not well no, known and understood that it's a problem. And, and when you hear testimony from somebody like Zuckerberg, does he get it? And what's going on, do you think? Yeah, it's, I think this is a situation amongst like my peers where it's a both and. Like we recognize that, yeah, social media has a lot of harms. We've experienced a lot of the harms ourselves, to like to our mental health, to our self-esteem, maybe to like our souls <laughs> in, in in several regards. But we also don't recognize how bad it is and how much social media shapes how we interact with people, how we think about ourselves, how it shapes society. Um, and I think a lot of people are starting to wake up to this because we're starting to see the negative like repercussions that social media has proliferated. Um, I think people who have a vested interest in making sure that social media stays profitable mm. like want to turn a blind eye to that reality. Um, so it's definitely a both end situation where it's like, we do see s some of the good things that have come through social media. Like personally, I've had a lot of good relationships cultivated through social media, but I've also experienced like the downsides sure. of maybe what that does to my brain or what that does, um, like say, if I'm having disagreement over social media, just like seeing all the negative consequences. Josh, there. man, politically mm -hmm. speaking, it's fascinating conversation uh, because as Liam says, uh, you know, th there is a kind of a caveat emptor element to it, I think. Parents and users have to have some responsibility, but at the same time, it's so ubiquitous now. Um, politically speaking, I, for people of a certain voting block, uh, 18, let's call them, uh, 20 something, you start going after their TikTok now. That's like their lifeblood, a lot of them. Yeah, and I mean, there's a real uh, kind of libertarian conflict here. Like how much how much do you regulate these things? But 
as statistics continue to to come out about the great harm that it's doing societally, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that the statistics are pretty compelling. It, social media does harm young people, especially. Um, and so some of the age restrictions that are being proposed, these all seem like reasonable things. We have a lot of analogous restrictions in society, whether it's movies or other kinds of uh, drugs, prescriptions, like there's all sorts of ways that we as a society have decided, look, we're going to play some card rails around certain things. But when it comes to technology, it seems like we just say, yeah, let's, let's just do the new thing. Like we, we don't really want to slow it down. Um, whether that's, I mean, we invest like crazy in it and, and we'll just figure out the repercussions later. And, with social media, you know, Facebook just turned 20. That's amazing. And it's taken this long. It's, it's this. acting like it too. Well, you? that's what I wondered, <laughs> yeah. Michael Ryan, like, is it just a failure of our imagination uh, or their imagination? I mean, I don't, I don't know their heads and hearts. I don't want to assign ill intent to everybody who came up with some sort of social media vehicle. But before you know it, it's like the genie's out of the bottle and it becomes a monster whether they intend to or not. How much of it was ill intent? And how much of it was just, oh, gosh, we've got a monster that's storming the village now? Well, I think it goes back to what Liam was saying, that they're, that they're in it for a profit, which is fine. But you got to look at the damage associated with it, too. And it's a little bit like the tobacco companies, you know, it, and the guardrails that you're talking about are so inconsistent. I mean, we can't have a cartoon character selling cigarettes. You know, <laughs> Joe Camel was put in prison years ago. Yeah. And yet we have this. Well, um, and in fact, shows on on Netflix now say uh, warning hist uh, historical smoking. Yeah, they, they actually have a warning. People are you're about to see people smoking in this show. To your yeah. point, well, which yeah. is funny. Yeah, and so you know, it's just um, it's a matter of uh, trying to get people to realize the harm that's going on, and it's a little bit like the tobacco companies had the moment before Congress, mm -hmm. you know, about the fact that they knew. What their product was doing and this is what holly was getting at with social media of course you wonder if the same outcome will happen 20 years from now will will social media liam do you suppose be <laughs> damaged like tobacco was and people will stop consuming it i don't see the same outcome uh it's hard to say because i think that the actual thing that props up social media i mean profits there's definitely one part of it but our entertainment culture is definitely another like consumer habits. Yeah. Like we're like my peers are we're being raised in a world where we're taught that being comfortable and being happy are the most important things. And so any sense of moral responsibility is curbed to meet those needs and those desires. So I think if we're going to see any change and to maybe combat a lot of the harmful things we see on social media, we have to kind of poke at those root causes of why people still keep coming back to it over and over and over again, even though it's hitting them over the head every and single time. I, and I do think there needs to be a high level discussion about accountability. Yes. So Liam, we'll stay with you for a minute because uh, you've written an op-ed at The Lion this week. For school choice advocates, the one thing that they hear so often is school choice will destroy uh, private schools in addition to public schools. There's always this idea that mm -hmm. if there's more school choice, uh, some kind of institution's going to have to fall. You've written an editorial rebutting that. Yeah. Yeah, there's several ways I think you can address that concern. First of all, I would say the concern is legitimate. Like there is legitimate reason, I think, to be skeptical of the potential for more state regulation. Um, and Thomas Sowell has a really good quote. I'm going to be paraphrasing it here, but uh, he he basically says that every policy with every policy there's trade-offs, and so we ha when looking at something, say school choice for instance, we have to ask ourselves, are the benefits more than the risk? And I think in this case you can definitely say yes. Like if we were to look at the landscape for just private education in general, states are the ones that regulate education, not the federal government. So we have that to be con we have that on the table. We also have to recognize that any state regulation is beholden to the Constitution. So it can't violate the First Amendment rights of private religious schools. So we have those constitutional protections for schools. And we also have to realize the fact that school choice policy is not coming with strings attached. Like we can re write responsible school choice policy that benefits students and families without putting the state into the mix. 
like um, like we were talking just the other day, Josh and I, and we were discussing how like the, one of the mottos of school choice is fund students, not systems. Yep. And there are ways that we can reflect that motto in the policies that we write. So I was kind of just just combating the notion that just because that risk is there, we should fear school choice in general. Yes. Which, in my opinion, the f- with the fear, we should instead say, no, like in the face of hostile actors, we need to be vigil- vigilant. We need to advocate for responsible policy, um, set up more guardrails, and to do what's right for families. It's an interesting mm-hmm. thing, yeah. Josh, because school choice, uh, when, you know, I've studied it over the years, and it, it isn't simply teachers' unions that oppose it. There are a number of people that are homeschoolers. When states start to release funds, for people to spend it as they see fit in what we call universal school choice models. You'll often see the movement attacked from from Christian schools and homeschoolers that say, oh, no, 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 no. We, as Liam was pointing out, we don't want anything to do with that either. So school choice advocates can get squeezed from both sides often. Yeah, and I think I think Liam makes a great point. Um, and it, it's important to know that we haven't, there are a number of ways that we already the government already regulates these areas. And so there, I think the trade-off um, idea is exactly right. Uh, there's always trade-offs when we're coming up with policies that might regulate or limit what, uh, what can be done. The important thing with um, the more recent push for school choice is having heard the concerns from various groups to build in safeguards, to build in Sometimes ex- uh, most of these laws now have explicit statements that say they will not violate the religious beliefs, they won't mandate curricula, um, they'll stay out. The other thing is you can always decide not to take the money. Um, and so for a family who has a conscientious or uh, uh, some objection in their conscience or some concern, they don't have to take the money. But there are a, ho- a whole lot of families who would like the opportunity to take some of the state funds that their children would get in a public school and use it in some other way. And so I think a lot of school choice advocates would say you can't make good the enemy of great. Yes. Or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And Michael, uh, to Josh's point, this is something that I heard Governor Sanders say of Arkansas, who passed universal school choice. Uh, Someone asked her recently, and I happened to be there covering this event, they said, what happens when you're not governor anymore? And she said, well, that's why elections matter, and you've got to stay vigilant as a voter. That is sort of an unsettling thought, though. It, she didn't really close the door on the idea that, hey, once I'm gone, who knows who could come in next and start to regulate the funds and the conditions under which you get them. You've got to be mindful of that. Yeah, you do. Um, and, I, and I agree with uh, Liam's uh, op-ed that uh, this is no reason to shy away from school choice. Absolutely not. Uh, but I do share some of the concerns uh, that people have. You know, even if, if I choose not to take uh, vouchers or whatever you want to call them, um, my neighbor may. And the regulations will follow my neighbor into my school. So, and, and you never know what's going to go on in the courts. I mean, you know, we have a legal environment where a football coach in Washington State was fired for silently praying, praying in his head after football games. Now, and it was a six to three Supreme Court judgment that upheld his right to do that, but that's six to, that's three people, that's three votes. Um, having said that, it just seems to me that the argument to make is that uh, it becomes the family's funds uh, when you get these ESAs. Um, and like any other government benefit, food stamps, uh, housing benefits, you, you take them out in the free market and spend them how you like. Um, I, I do think it's important that in the Arizona law, Josh, as you were mentioning, that it does say uh, that uh, this shall not be required to alter its creed, these schools, alter its creed, practices, admissions policy, or curriculum. And I think that's probably a vital passage for any state law. Well, I, would, I would second it. You'd think you'd have to iron that in there uh, and make sure that stays. How about this story uh, from the, speaking of taxpayer dollars, the National Institutes of Health, Josh Mann, <laughs> spending $200,000 of your taxpayer money and mine on a brand new initiative. Tell us about it. Yeah, so this is a, a, a grant to a University of Cincinnati group who 
have produced a transgender voice training app. And so the, the problem that they're trying to solve is what happens when a person wants to talk as if they are the other gender. And so I think the, the starting group, eventually they hope that the app will reach men and women who transition to the opposite gender, but they're gonna start with biological men who wish to sound like women. Now this is $217,000 or so of taxpayer funds from the NIH to, uh, to do this project, and they're gonna start with about 40 biological men uh, to do it. And I can guarantee, uh, having been an academic, when you write grant proposals, I mean, I'm not surprised this passed in today's environment. You, they're going to write the type of proposal they know will, will pass, and it has all of the, the kind the of buzzwords. desirable sure. buzzwords. Yeah. Yeah. It's inclusive. It's all of these things. Um, and, and I think, you know, taxpayers would be right to, to question now, do we really want to be funding this kind of study? The uh, use of a, an, a, a transgender voice training app for men to sound more feminine, Liam. I, I don't know what more to say about that than just that, <laughs> and you comment as you see fit. Well, now we know there is an app for everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, hey, by the way, is there a cost to that? Do I have to pay on, uh, like, Apple, iTunes uh, to download uh, the app? I don't know. Anyway. Well, I, yeah. I could go a lot of ways. Yeah, I know you could. <laughs> Uh, yeah. This does seem to be a rather unusual federal priority. Um, I wonder what they're going, what part of the transitioning process they're going to fund next. I mean, there's a number of ways that you could help that out. And this but, is to do what? I'm sorry, just so I'm clear. This is an app that would use for what exactly? It would help train your voice. So if you know, oh, as, like as a, a biological man, to, man could yeah, learn to how be to be like sound. more female presenting isn't, or male presenting. Isn't that what we have mm. Taylor Swift for? Yeah. That's my question. <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, <laughs> but you know, with, with all the uh, war and pestilence going on, it's a, a strange priority. So I looked at the NIH's priorities online, and they list them, and this was not one of them: <laughs> uh, heart, cancer, infectious disease, opioids, and diabetes. So I'm to take it. Uh, that COVID's over, obesity is cured, <laughs> kids aren't dying of fentanyl. You know, there are a lot of, uh, there's a ton more issues for us to worry about when it comes to adolescents than how their voice sounds. Um, social media addiction, we, we talked about a little bit of that, self-harm, mental health. This is just really bizarre. We were talking about uh, another, I, in my view, bizarre story out of Montana, Liam, uh, mm -hmm. this week. And this is another story at the line you ought to read about. Because this is the horror of horrors. When you talk about this issue of gender transitioning, we have heard of state governments that are getting involved and telling parents, if you won't go along with this, schools are getting involved, governments are getting involved and saying you're being cruel to the child for not allowing it. Is that about the sum total of this story? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what basically happened in the story is um, this Montana family, uh, they were an adoptive family. Their daughter um, was experiencing a lot of mental health issues, and they discovered that the doctor said the child wants to identify as a male. Um, she's a 14-year-old girl. And they were like, no, that, that contradicts our religious convictions. And so they wanted to just work with the healthcare providers to help their kid with her mental health but what they were saying was that no her mental health issues are being caused by the fact of your rejection the fact of her so-called gender dysphoria there's no other there's no other reasons that she might be experiencing suicide and unfortunately it's part of this is this story is part of a greater narrative where <laughs> unfortunately parents are being told Either you affirm, like either you affirm your kid's gender identity or you have a dead child. And it's, I mean, we've talked about this before, that's emotional blackmail. And it's just this really disheartening story that we're starting to see uh, more and more common just with the medical establishment. Michael Ryan, mm -hmm. the state will tell parents they are being abusive if they don't allow them to go forward with gender transition surgery. That's yeah. the sum total of it. Yeah, I mean, the little me uh, surely would have wished that I could have gotten the governor to come home and tell my parents what I wanted, uh, <laughs> but it didn't work out that way for me. This does, in a strange way, put children in charge of the ho household. Right. Uh, and, you know, it's the government taking children out of a household, not because of abuse, but because they disagree with how they're parented. 
Uh, that's that's a strange Rubicon to mm -hmm. cross. Um, you know, we don't let, as a society, and most parents, we don't let kids uh, drink alcohol, uh, you know, buy guns, smoke. But at the same time, if the child wants to have a sex change, that's okay and must be done. And, and to be fair, Josh, I think this is the sort of story, uh, as we go back a couple of stories we were just discussing ago, where... Uh, Homeschool advocates would say, well, you see what they're doing in Montana? This is exactly the kind of thing we're afraid of from, from government. I mean, there, there are a lot of reasons to be concerned about the heavy hand of government right now. Yeah, I mean, and the chilling part in this story is that um, the, the parents agreed reluctantly to uh, let their child be sent to a, a kind of a rehabilitation center. Um, they just wanted it to be within Montana where they're from. Well, the doctors chose Wyoming. And when the parents objected, uh, police showed up at the door and CFS showed up. And that's when really I think the custody battle came to a head. And they were accused of refusing medical care for their child. Now, you could see why CFS gets involved in cases like this. But when we understand what they meant by refused medical care, well, they refused to accept mm -hmm. the, the stated gender of their child. Um, and the end of the story is even sadder. January 19th, the court basically gave CFS custody of their daughter. And so that's why the parents use this language of they kidnapped her. And she has since, the daughter has since been given, uh, the custody of the daughter has since gone to her biological mother, who, according to uh, the story, has a history of abuse. And so the wow. state was willing to, um, you know, basically prioritize an abusive mother who will affirm the gender of this girl rather than her own parents who love her who just whose religious convictions won't tolerate and, and this is where we are I mean if you're a parent watch out that your priorities aren't different from the government Josh man the story as you uh, self-described academic you will appreciate this and probably be able to speak to it the best at the lion the Dartmouth Standardized test returns. This is something that we've talked about over the weeks on the show, that um, affirmative action hiring and admissions have been sort of the rule, but maybe Dartmouth is reversing course a little bit. Yeah, and I think Dartmouth is the uh, first Ivy League to, to go officially all the way back to standardized tests as um, prerequisite for admissions. So submit those SAT and ACT scores, uh, students. That what they found is they did an internal study. And so when COVID happened, a lot of these universities um, went to a temporary test optional model, including the Ivy League, but a lot of universities did this. Um, it was harder to take these tests, and it gave them a lot of data over the past few years. Does this work? Do, are we getting better students? And, you know, a lot of universities are um, – I mean, we've seen this with the affirmative action debate uh, – they prioritize diverse student populations, et cetera. What they found was actually this didn't solve any of those problems, that when you stopped using test scores, it, uh, the other factors that they were using for admission does not result in more diverse student population, and it actually hurt lower income students. So it turns out these merit-based test scores are great predictors of college success. And so kudos to Dartmouth for studying it and going with where the results led. Um, but uh, at least one other Ivy League, Columbia, has made their test optional policy permanent, so they've kind of moved the other direction. So we'll see where colleges land on this issue. Yeah, the return of meritocracy, Michael Ryan. Is it possible? I, I don't know. Dogs and cats living together? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Um, you know, and, and you have to wonder if COVID was the reason or the excuse, because this has been coming for some time, this, this turn away from standardized tests. In fact, uh, the uh, NEA Today magazine wrote just a few years ago, since their inception a century ago, standardized tests have been instruments of racism and a biased system. Students of color, particularly those, uh, those from low-income families, have suffered the most from high-stakes testing in U.S. public schools. But this change by Dartmouth makes you wonder if SAT and, and ACT, are they predictive of success? If so, does not using it set minority students up for failure? 
One more before uh, I hand it over to you for your favorites of the week, and that is, uh, I think, an important story about a public school teacher, a former public school teacher, uh, Josh, who explains her reasons for leaving. You know, we we talk a lot about school choice, but what you don't often hear are a lot of disgruntled, unhappy, dissatisfied public school teachers that have decided to leave for various reasons, and you've chronicled just such a story. Yes, uh, this was a man who, who wrote his story in a book called Conflicted, and so we've got a little summary of the book up on the line. Um, it explains his reasons for leaving public education, and he, he really begins with kind of a chilling comparison of public education as he sees it with the uh, Nazi regime of uh, Hitler's time and how basically public education was used to undermine the family. Now that, that sounds like an extreme analogy and one that I think um, deserves critical uh, caution. However, um, he, he writes compellingly about some of the similarities, for example, uh, a changing of curricula, uh, a questioning of parents' rights if when the parents disagree with a certain ideology. I mean, we just discussed this. And so I'm always hesitant when I see any comparison with that word Nazi yep. or Hitler. <laughs> but when we just have described what happened in Montana and you see some of the comparisons, I think it at least serves as a warning when you look at how the education system was used to undermine parental authority in times past in mm-hmm. other places and states. It's, it's worth just saying, what could go wrong here? Well, a lot could go wrong. Liam, I have a working theory, and you tell me if you think I'm right or wrong, that young men, late teens, early 20s, that have been through a, a lot of the public education system, I am sensing that there is a, a whipsaw effect. I'm sensing particularly a young, uh, amongst young men there, there seems to be a growing resistance of just kind of swallowing hook, line, and sinker a lot of the social ideology that has entered in. Is that your interpretation or just something I made up? Yeah, I mean, the, the trends are definitely going in that direction. If you look at studies that are showing the political views of young women and young men, young women are going, uh, young women are going fairly liberal, but young men are going fairly to the right. And when they say the right, it doesn't necessarily mean conservatism, but it does mean that they are disaffected with kind of the mainstream narrative of things. And that's simply something definitely that I think um, people who are concerned with these issues need to like take note of because these men are not necessarily going to constructive ideas. They're going to things that are, are dark and pessimistic right. and... I mean, I mean, you can talk about like the man of sphere, like Andrew Tate, like stuff like that. Um, but no, things are definitely going in that direction. And I think it's something to be concerned about because our public school system isn't offering young men hope. It's not offering young men creative vision and purpose for their lives. And so who's going to fill the void? It's either going to it's <laughs> it's not going to be the public school system. It's going to be a whole other host of destructive things. I wonder if, Michael, does mm-hmm. that mean yeah. is that Pollyanna to say that maybe you have a, a younger um, constituency of, of American that's coming up thinking about education differently, organically, or uh, is it still too ingrained? Public school is just the way you raise a kid. Well, I think it's a, a, I, I think you're right, Liam, and I, but I think it's a great uphill battle, uh, and it has to be fought. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a video on Twitter uh, this past week of a teacher carefully, cautiously, calmly, but firmly talking this kid through, the student, uh, his belief that J.K. Rowling is bigoted towards trans people. So, I mean, it just, he kind of taught in, in just a couple minutes on this video, he taught this kid how to critically think. And by the end, the student was saying, yeah, that was pretty stupid of me to think that. Mm-hmm. So I think yeah, critical I saw, I thinking, the video. right? Mm-hmm. Critical thinking skills mm-hmm. is really important here. Um, you know, I've long said that uh, there are five pillars of power in society, government, media, education, business, and family. And there are wedges in there uh, in all of those pillars between parents and in many cases Christians and their children or society. Uh, The majority of those five pillars right now, the environment is not all that friendly to Christians. Before we wrap up, I always like to ask the panel their favorite stories, stories they'd like to call your specific attention to at the Lions. So we start with you, Michael Ryan. What's your favorite of the week? 
Well, it's something uh, we didn't talk about. Uh, it was the story of uh, Riley Gaines and Bethany Hamilton on tour for Brave Books, stopping in Springfield, Missouri to have a story hour with kids. And it was a huge success. Everybody came out to see them. Uh, but there was one headline in the media that said, Controversial athlete duo brings big crowd to Springfield Library Center. Controversial. Controversial. You got to be controversial, you know? <laughs> Fighting for women's sports, wholesome books for kids. What's not to hate? <laughs> Liam, what do you like? Um, I was actually going to refer to the same story. I think the part of that story that was really funny to me, um, had a good laugh about it, is that there were protesters who showed up to the event. And we you know Bethany Hamilton, like she was a victim of a shark attack. And one of the protesters had like a shark plushie. Oh, like, very nice. Which. I, I laughed at it because I don't think that person realized the irony of that. I don't think it was intentional because the shark, like the Ikea shark, is like a, supposed to be a trans symbol or whatever. Oh, I see. So they were bringing it to like say I'm for trans rights, but Missing like unironically <laughs> it's like that woman over there was bitten by a shark. And I – the world we live in. Yeah, it's, that's it's right. It's funny. Josh Mann. Yeah, well, I, uh, on the, the, the idea of um, higher education, we had a story about how states are cutting college degrees from some of their uh, government jobs, college degree requirements, which I think might be a great idea. But at the same time, some of these same states are mandating FAFSA applications. And so you've got the, a lot of state governments continuing to push kids towards expensive higher education while at the same time not – you know, not being able to hire people and, and lowering their degree requirements. There's at least some contradiction there. And so um, I think we, we, we've got to keep our finger on it, and you can guarantee we will at the Lions. Another week of great stories. Gentlemen, thank you all very, very much. That's going to do it for us this week. Be sure to keep up to date on all the latest news stories, these and so many more, every single day at readlion.com. For all of us at the Lion, thanks for downloading the show, and we'll see you next time.